Welcome to another special edition of Score Talk, where we discuss gems in the world of film music. I'm Zeb Burrows, coming to you from New York City. And I'm Royam Stanich, coming to you from London, UK, where it is freezing cold. Oh, it's not. It's not nearly as bad in here in New York as it was last week. Last week was a downright nightmare. Is it snowing uh, by you? Or? We we got some snow a couple of days ago, but it's kind of melting now, and it's just it's a little cold. It's it's hat weather, but it's not it's not you know freezing cold. You have to bundle up weather as right. it was the other day. So right. it's not it's not nearly as bad. Okay. Uh, it's not the crisp autumn season of uh, of the movie that we're going to be discussing today. So you know. Yeah. So and what is that movie? We are discussing the very, very popular Steven Spielberg movie from 1982, E.T., The Extraterrestrial, which upon release surpassed Star Wars to become the highest grossing movie at the box office yeah, yeah. worldwide at the time, hold, held the record for 11 years until Spielberg's own Jurassic Park eclipsed that record. And What, um, what number film was this in Spielberg and Williams' collaboration? Do you have that information to hand? Well, uh, Spielberg, Spielberg, do, 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 um, filmography. I feel like so we're already starting to see the score here. If we're, if we're starting, if we're starting with his very, if we're starting his very first film, his very first feature, studio feature, we're not counting Duel, um, which is mostly considered a TV movie. We're starting with the Sugarland Express. Oh, yeah. Um, starting with Sugarland Express in 1974, Sugarland Jaws, Close Encounters, 1941 Raiders. This was number six. For this was Spielberg's sixth directorial feature and his sixth collaboration with John Williams, um, who um, has composed, oh, of course, has composed the scores for every single Spielberg film to date, save for The Color Purple in 1985, which was composed by Quincy Jones. Um, and that was only because there was a scheduling conflict, not because. No, no, because uh, no, because Quincy was, I believe, one of the producers, and he insisted uh -huh. on scoring them, and he insisted on scoring the movie himself. Uh -huh. um, uh, and then, 2015, Bridge of Spies, which was composed by Thomas Newman, and that was that because was William because of scheduling conflict. Scheduling plus um, Williams had a minor health blip right. and couldn't do it, and could only devote to his time to The Force Awakens. And then um, Spielberg's, mo Spielberg's most recent, uh, Ready Player One, which was Alan Silvestri, which again, Spiel uh, Williams departed to work on Spielberg's other movie, The Post. So, That's right. you know, so. Um, but was but, uh, by none other than Alan Silvestri. So. Right, right. Also um, so, um, but upon release, uh, E.T. in 1982, was nominated for nine Oscars, one for four, best sound, best sound effects editing, best visual effects, and of course, the best original score. Um, and on this most recent poll, we decided that this being the poll before the Oscars, um, <clears throat> that we would focus on scores that had previously won best original score. And, you know, we try to make the choices so that there's a tight, even race, and that didn't happen at all this week. So there you go. <laughs> you know ET, what, though? I, I, believe it or not, I think it's this is our sixth episode, and we actually haven't covered the John Williams score yet. So I'm quite well, delighted you know, that this one is the one that's been picked. The one, the one Williams that was picked. Yeah. Um, you know, it was not. It did not win uh, Best Picture that year. It lost to Gandhi oh. by Richard Attenborough. Um, and uh, you know, I, so. I'd, yeah, I'd like to just clarify here because I know people have asked um, mm -hmm. movies that we or, or scores I should say that we have put in the poll that don't that don't take the cake. We'll we'll definitely we do plan to revisit them. Um, mm -hmm. They're not just you know now brushed under the rug and we're never going to talk about them again. Mm -hmm. you know, uh, there have been a few that we've put on the poll that have been like, oh, you know, it would be nice to talk about Yentl, for example. Um, mm -hmm. um, and, and polls before as well, polls in the, in, in the first five weeks. Sure. Um, yeah, so just to clarify. Right. And so this movie is, you know, I was, as I saw the movie again uh, the other night for the first time in probably eight years. This is my third time through E.T. And I just, there's no 
other movie in the Spielberg canon, except for maybe Jaws, where Williams is really doing most of the legwork. Um, I can't I can't recall a single other movie that they've made, even where I think the scores, um, even if I like some of the movies more than Jaws or E.T., like Raiders of the Lost Ark is my favorite Spielberg film. But even then, E.T., the... The amount of work, the amount that Williams is just enhancing the movies in, in the context of E.T. and Jaws uh, surpasses, I think, almost any other movie that Spielberg has done to date. Because, um, you know, if you if you look at some of his other movies, you could probably take away some of the scores. And it's not it. I'm not saying it's not, you know, I'm not saying it's um, a better movie, not by any means necessary, but it's not. But the. The amount, the amount that E.T., the scores for E.T. and Jaws are just enhancing the picture are just incredibly greater than probably some of Spielberg's other movies. So, And it's just the two where he just brought out the best in Williams. And, you know, so uh-huh. what do you think? Because in, in an interview, Spielberg has said John Williams is E.T. Yeah. So, and, and I don't think, I don't, I can't name another movie where it kind of it well except for jaws and probably star wars even though star wars wasn't spielberg um it still has yeah. that kind of well john williams i tell you what he's he's really obviously a, a film composer has to be adaptable but you know film schools aren't supposed to overshadow uh the picture right uh, it's supposed to be they're, su- they're supposed to enhance the picture they're supposed to enhance and, the picture, and you want you bet you want the score to barely be noticeable we notice scores because mm-hmm. we're musically inclined and so we pick up on those things but mm-hmm. what's interesting is is that what you say about what spielberg says um that uh williams is et but even so he doesn't take center state like okay the score is oh my gosh it's fantastic but he doesn't um uh what's the word i'm looking for he doesn't overshadow the picture with his score you know it's still just there to support the story, but just in the most right uplifting and way. I, it, it don't feel like oh gosh, you know, this is some this is a guy who just wants to show off a little. It's still so humble, you know. It is. It is very humble, and uh, and you know, and I was watching, and when I was watching the movie again, I remember that what you had said in regards to Harry Ricks and Williams mm-hmm. about planting seeds. Yes. That's exactly what Williams is doing here, and That's where else, where, yeah. where is, where else are you going to get it but John Williams? And no. you know, he he starts planting seeds from the very first cues of yeah. the picture. We start we start hearing that wonder theme, da 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 da, da very very he early it. on. He, he orchestrates it very differently in all different areas of the film, which is oh, of course really really you know, nice. It's, it's most often heard on um, I think a flute. I think most prominently a flute. Sometimes the brass has it, but but it's the wonder theme. And let's just let's go ahead and play that. Oh, sure. Is it called the wonder theme? Um, I'm looking at a uh, I'm looking at a review of the ET score, and and the reviewer does call it the wonder theme, consisting of two six note figures on flute and serving as the bookends of the score. It's the first and last melody you hear in the film. But if you remember, if you remember the last shots of the movie, mm-hmm. where you know it, it has it cuts from uh, the spaceship back to each of the different people that ET has impacted, uh, beginning with the mom and then Elliot, and then culminating with that final shot of Elliot. He uses that theme on the big brass, but in the earlier parts of the movie, he starts it on flute.
Yeah, that's oh. a gorgeous thing. Um, yeah. Let's talk about, I mean, ha, I, I was quite interested in his uh, placement of music mm -hmm. because there was a long stretch of nothing. I think that's we, true. We, we were first introduced to some, um, um, it was the keys theme. Mm -hmm. what it's called, um, which starts around five minutes or so. And actually, mm -hmm. I, I, I should mention, I've um, someone on the GCN team, Mitch Gardner, he mm -hmm. wrote a 1500-word essay recently on ET. So he's, mm -hmm. he's allowed me to have a glance through his essay. Um, mm -hmm. And he speaks about, you know, the, the, the part where ET is, is running away after, after they've noticed him and how John Williams starts off on low woodwinds and he builds up to this moment with the big clarinet. Right, and, right, um, and, yeah. and we, had, we, had, we had mentioned, I think we had talked about, it's, a, it's an homage of sorts to Citizen Kane, and the yes. opening of Citizen Kane and, the, and that great Bernard Herrmann opening yes. with the low rowling woodwinds. And at one I, point, yeah. one, of the themes, one of the themes actually starts out with the exact first three same notes as the rosebud theme. In yeah. Citizen Kane, but it, it doesn't. It's not enough to plagiarize. But I was, it's. I was quite astounded uh, during the first few minutes. I thought to myself, <clears throat> "This is this is someone who has been deeply inspired by Bernard Herrmann." There's no oh, yeah. doubt. I felt mm -hmm. also at certain points that I was hearing the Psycho score. Do you know the part um, um, during the Psycho score that goes? Da 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 da. There was a bit. There was a bit in ET that sounded. Almost similar. It's funny that you thought psycho over that. That's the theme that plays over the end credits and it has solo piano. <laughs> yeah. It's so funny that you thought of psycho when you thought of that. Which now now I'm hearing it and I'm going, yeah, I understand yeah, that quite a bit. Totally, totally. Yeah. But he was but, and he did actually he actually, I mean, I, I, I wrote a spotlight on John Williams um, uh, a couple of weeks ago, so I, I am aware that he, he worked with Bernard Herrmann. He actually had the opportunity to not just learn from him, but they mm -hmm. worked together. So, so I mean, yep. I guess, you know, student always learns from his master, I, you know, that's, that's, that's how and, it works. And, and, and Bernard Herrmann is the master. So. Yeah, we know you love oh. him, Zev. <laughs> yes. But, um, but Williams, I mean, Williams always brings up Herman whenever he has an opportunity in, um, and always brings up their friendship. So uh -huh. it's um, it's it's touching to hear that. And the uh, he doesn't use a lot of the same harm. Uh, it's very different in harmonic language and orchestration too. Mm -hmm. um, the rest of the score from Herman, you can easily see because I can guarantee you that Herman probably would never have scored this and if he did it would have been so so different from what williams had done i think there's been very very few cases where a composer has been more appropriate to score a certain movie than williams and yeah. et yeah, he, he poured yeah. he, he poured he poured his heart and soul he into into this movie maybe more than any other movie he's ever written music for and that's a big big statement um, I wonder why. That's, I wonder and, if he identifies that's, with this in some particular way. He, he, he might have. He might have. And we, we had mentioned, I, I remember talking to you about a little bit about this before, um, before recording. One of the many criticisms of Steven Spielberg is that, and from the, the, the detractions that Spielberg gets, is that he's too sentimental and that he's too, yeah. and that he's too manipulative. Manipulative and how? Manipulative in that he wants to, you know, pull the arty audience's heartstrings, and you know, oh, and that's what makes a good storyteller. I guess, I guess, all movies are manipulative sure. in that sense, in that sense. But I think Spielberg often gets, he gets a lot of detraction because he just does it in ways that just, you know, it's maybe it's too sugary or maybe it's too unrealistic or. You know, he's okay. too much. He's too much of a sentimentalist. Okay. Um, and you can you can find these criticisms throughout a, a lot of his movies. You you can find them being directed at E.T. You can find them being directed at Hook, at A.I., and probably a couple of others uh, that right. I'm just forgetting right now. Right. The difference is the different. The difference is yes, he does it in E.T., but it works so brilliantly. 
it works bri- it works brilliantly how he pulls at our heartstrings and this, he needed to do it he needed to do it because because uh, you can feel i was reading about et and and about about elliot the main character of elliot who is 10 years eight or eight or 10 years old a child of divorce spielberg <clears throat> himself was a child of divorce and didn't really have a connection with his father and uh, he filled the void I'm reading right now he filled the void with this alien friend so in that in that sense you can feel that he just poured every bit of himself but you into want this a direct, movie. I mean you want a director who's gonna show his vulnerabilities through his film it that's what makes the film so beautiful and um, I feel like when you're touched so deeply by a film, and we all know that the music is a, a massive part of that, um, that the composer himself has also injected a piece of himself into his work. Because that that is how you connect with your audience. You've got mm-hmm. to know your audience's psyche. And when you give a chunk of yourself, like you, like they did, like they both did, and mm-hmm. you get such a huge response, you know that that was the right thing to do. Right. Um, so perhaps, yeah, perhaps Spielberg is from time to time too sugary, too sweet. But when it comes but, to the films that require a, a, a different approach, for example, Schindler's List, mm-hmm. he, he knows how to deliver. So, well, um, well, well, Sch- Schindler's List is a very, very different movie from E.T. And in my in my most generous mood, I might call this a better movie in some in some respects. Than you Schindler. can't even make a comparison. I just mean to say that. You know, you can't typecast Spielberg, so to speak, as, as right. just one way. He knows how to adapt. He knows what his audience needs for a particular film. I mean, mm-hmm. you know, I, I, one of my favorites by far, and is, and is hands down also my favorite John Williams score, is Catch Me If You Can. Um, not necessarily the entire score, but that opening theme, it, it, mm-hmm. it, it just kills me. I absolutely adore it. It's, my, it's for sure my favorite. I mean, per- perfectly executed by both. I thought that movie was genius. Genius. I think we're getting away a little bit just from some of the detractor that Spielberg gets for his sentimentality, because I, I don't get that vibe from Catch Me If You Can, although I haven't seen Catch Me If You Can in quite some time. That's exactly my point. Um, I'd like, I'm just pointing out the fact that it's not so true. I think maybe his sweet movies are a little extra slushy, sure, but they need to be magnified sometimes on screen. That's true, and it works brilliantly in E.T., but in movies like Hook, it does not work at all. And because, and the reason why I think Hook is not a good movie, and I'm sorry to everyone's childhood I just ruined, but wake up. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I know I'm cruel. But Hook, it's something that Spielberg himself doesn't even really care that much for. I you know, I think, I think the reason why E.T. is so good, and the reason why E.T. is a masterpiece, one of the reasons why it's a masterpiece, is because he just injected all that he could into this movie he put he poured every ounce of himself into the movie and you don't you don't get that from hook yeah. you don't and um, there's not very very there's not very much material to identify with again in uh, hook no there no hook, there really there the really is like there's so many elements in there he's a child he's a he's, He's a child of divorce. Exactly. He doesn't have that. He doesn't have that many friends. He has a wild imagination. Mm. He's totally genuine, and he, you just you just fall in love with the kid. And I'm sure Williams felt the exact same way. And um, I'd love to point out this this particular friendship with Elliot and E.T. <clears throat> By the way, mm-hmm. I, I was curious. It probably means nothing, but gosh, I just realized on a deeper level now. But I noticed that Elliot has the you know his, the first letter and the last letter of his name is spelled E T, and they yep. have a very very deep connection. Um, mm-hmm. Like uh, Elliot's a- attached to E T, and they feed off each other's feelings, um, mm-hmm. and um, even physical. They have they, they have a physical. psychological connection. Correct, and now I'm beginning to think to myself, this is what it's like for Spielberg with film. Mm-hmm. This is the same kind of relationship. This is how he expresses himself. This is this is what he does. And when he put and ah, oh, there's so many different levels to how you can you know look at that. Mm-hmm. Yeah, well, it's all there. There is. But, you know. Right. You know, E.T. also 
extraterrestrial, but, you know. Well, uh, yes, that was intentional. <laughs> but, no, I, I think I, I can't remember the last time where a story of friendship so diverse, you know, just moved me so, so freaking much. Mm. And, you know, I think... You know, it's just it's just pure magic. Getting back to getting back to Williams, there's an opportunity to do a little in joke in the Halloween sequence because there's there's a Yoda costume. There's a guy in a Yoda, yes. in a Yoda costume that walks by, and he and the Yoda theme <laughs> makes an appearance. So let's play a little let's play a little bit of that. Let's <laughs> all right. liked it when uh when uh, et goes phone home or something home home when he right. saw yoda i thought right, just so right. Adorable. it's so um, uh, it is ad- it is adorable he's cute, um, ET. i mean he's lovable don't you just love him i do those I, eyes I love and those expressions that he makes and oh oh yeah what's what's really interesting is i was noticing before the before the flying theme makes its first grand statement um, as they're in the forest and they fly over the moon and that extraordinarily iconic shot. I think uh, we hear some little bits where the piano and uh, and I think the strings are experimenting. It's just after the Halloween sequence. I think he's experimenting with polytonality quite a little bit. He's in two different keys mm. at once and um, it just tells you that we're, you know, e- Elliot's about to experience something that he's never experienced before. And of course, flying over the moon is that experience. And then William's theme just soars. And that's the, and that's that you know theme. Something? All I have in my notes, I think after I'd listened um, and watched that scene, I was done with note taking. I was already totally enthralled and I was just watching. But all I've got on my notes when it comes to that bicycle flying across the moon. I right. have bike theme dash John Williams I mean that is that is John Williams in a nutshell. That yes. that, that piece. Everything about it. Those the strings have their in octaves, the wind, the woodwind runs, yeah, yeah. um the the wind supports that he's getting and the brass support that he's getting and uh his use of I think it's the Glockenspiel. Um, in the flying theme as counterpoint. Is that? Um, is in, that? Okay. It, yeah, yeah, he has, um, and this may this may just be in the concert suite version, mm. where he has the glockenspiel in in unison with uh, those with fluttering woodwinds, while the flying theme is still going. Mm-hmm. You know that that may be the concert version because I didn't I I can't remember where that's really present in the movie because I haven't seen ET enough times, mm-hmm. but you know it just his orchestration sense is you know as some people said he's just so far ahead of everybody else (laughs) in terms of orchestration but and it's also it's also been said that even though uh he's doing his own orchestrations more now he had an orchestrator for a long time called herbert spencer who worked with him on star wars and indiana jones and Mm et um and worked with him a lot in his career but i think that the sketches that williams would give were so detailed that the the score was basically done and all spencer had to do was just put it on the big orchestra paper with all the instruments right you know written out because the work had just been done williams had done all the work already i find it fascinating that he could just sit there 
with a paper and a pencil and and write a score a whole score just write a score like that on pen and paper with pen. you know it's 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 quite something you know um, you know and you know any omar Kone is one of the only other people who does it yeah. bernard Her bernard herman did his own scores yeah, all by himself. At that point, they didn't really have the technology that we have today. Ben Hammond couldn't exactly fire up a computer and, and put in some MIDI. I mean, and, was, and and even and even if he did, I probably don't think he. And even he if he was able to, yeah, he, he probably wouldn't. He probably wouldn't. He probably wouldn't. But um, I was watching you know. the movie last night with a fellow team member of GCN, and um, when we finished, I said to him, "I wonder what." What's going on in John Williams' head? <laughs> what What are his thoughts? Does he think like a regular person, or is it all in music? Because having that ability, I just I wonder when do you when does it turn off? Does it ever turn off? <laughs> it, it It may never turn off. Then you know, I think the only I think the only thing is to ask John Williams. You know, I'd love to. <laughs> well, I think I think we'd all love to, but um, yeah. he still. One of the very few people on the planet who doesn't do mockups, who doesn't work with with the computers. Yeah, um, I, I think uh, though it's not necessarily because he doesn't want to. He said that he just doesn't. He doesn't think um, he has the time. And now with his age, to actually learn how to use a computer properly. And well, also, also he works with less and less directors um, as the year has gone on. In the past, in the past ten years, he's worked with really only a couple of directors I'm looking at Williams uh, filmography and but in the last in the last 10 years he's only worked with four other directors besides Steven Spielberg he's worked with Brian Percival on the book thief JJ Abrams and Ryan Johnson on the latest two Star Wars movies mm -hmm. and uh, Glenn Keane on the animated short film Dear Basketball right Right. So, um, other than that, he's just been working steadily with Spielberg yeah. most of the remainder of his career, and you know he barely he barely works with other directors nowadays. But in the '90s and the '80s, he would work with an assortment of different. In the '70s too, he worked with a number of different directors. But um, I just think that you know directors they kind of need to hear. Most directors need to now need to hear the full mock-up. And you know, it's just gotten to a point with Spielberg and Williams where that doesn't need to be the case anymore. And Spielberg, I'm sure, does not provide Williams with tech because I think one of the things with John Williams is that he will not score your movie if you give him tent music, mm -hmm. which which Ryan Johnson ignored on the Last Jedi and gave Williams a temp track. But Williams did it. But Williams did it anyway. Wow. Um, and I, I I don't like Ryan Johnson at all. So. Yeah. Um, um, did you? What I liked about this as well was there was a lot of double meanings with some of the stuff that he yeah. wrote. For example, my, my example that I actually I remember writing down was during the trail to get E.T. <clears throat> into into the bedroom or into that room. Uh, Elliot was mm -hmm. like uh, putting down what was it? Some kind of sweets or something, some candies. And you had these violins that they were kind of like tremolos. Um, right. Which kind of like evoked a sense of wonder, but at the same time you're thinking they do sound like sirens. It's just like danger. It's, it's, it is, and it, and, it does, and it does, and it does, and it does turn out to be danger for both Elliot and ET, as we see later in the picture. And one of my favorite lines of the movie was when the mother comes into the room when it's a wreck and she goes, this is no room, this is an accident. And I thought, oh, hell yes, this is one big accident. I, every time I hear a line like that, I, I, think, I think of Obi-Wan's, that's no moon, it's a space station. <laughs> so I, kind of, I almost expected to hear that. And you know, there, there are a couple of other Star Wars references in the movie. Sweet. It's like what Pixar do. I don't know if you've noticed. Pixar. Oh yeah, there's a there's a there's a pizza planet truck in almost there's, every Pixar there's something movie. Almost in there. There's also a college room number that they were that two of the I don't know artists or animators or producers directors used to share a room in college. So they stick right. that on like a, like a, a place where you you might see letters and numbers like A seventy six or something, yep. and it's in every a, single Pixar a, movie. A, AK like two seventy one or something. So, something obscure. So, like so, that, something yeah. like that. But that. But that. But that. But that's Pixar, and you know. 
you know, I'm sure, and the guys at Pixar, I'm sure, were all deeply inspired by E.T. and by Spielberg. So everybody was, of course. But any any final thoughts on on the score on this collaboration? By the way, this collaboration, which has which is scene number twenty nine, once Spielberg makes Indiana Jones five, which I kind of don't want Indiana Jones five, and nobody really wanted Indiana Jones four, but you know. It just it's it's had 28 collaborations and it may be it may be the most prolific uh, director composer collaboration in the history of cinema. So do we ever any... find out why those let's just call them aliens because extraterrestrials sometimes a bit too wordy for a podcast? Um, why did they come to Earth? They 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 were I read they were botanists. And they were they were studying plants, and of course, uh, ET has the connection with the chrysanthemum flowers, and uh, you know that. is Every able time to. That theme started, it was beautiful. That is, yeah. Why don't we play that? Let's play that theme. So let's just be clear: when ET has this effect on the plants, that they bloom when he mm-hmm. thinks about them or looks at them, um, and yeah. this is the music that was played. Uh, it's amazing how this collaboration has lasted over, you know, 45 years and is still continuing um, all the way from 1974 up through the present day. And, you know, and it's, you know, they only let in a couple of different people to sort of, you know, do some temporary work. It's almost like it's almost like Spielberg Williams. It's almost like a full time job. For both of them, in a sense, and then it's almost and people have considered compared it to a marriage of sorts. Mm. Were you aware that Spielberg uses Williams music in his trailers, and and his and the ET music was actually used in the trailer? I'm, ET. I'm. Pr- I think I remember something like that. What I but ET ET is the best example, and I know it was used in the Jaws trailer too. He does that um, because he he thinks it will further help. Uh, oh, yeah. Sell the film. oh yeah. Oh yeah. Which oh yeah, is very smart because it will. It is. It, it is very smart because <laughs> because because the music for these films just enhances them like nobody's business, um, especially in the cases of Jaws and E.T., um, which I think are the two best examples of these uh, circumstances. But really, you know, this collaboration, I, I I'd like to talk a little bit more about this because I can't name another one that has lasted so long. You know, no, that there's collaboration other- has. Uh, as as the article say, as everybody says, has revolutionized um, has re- revolutionized cinema, and mm-hmm. um, it's it's just, it's just a collaboration that show how much director's vision can be enhanced by a composer who just really get their direction and, and their approach, and um, you know you can stick you can stick the names of Spielberg and um, and. Uh, Williams in a trailer, and you've got people's interest. People are, are intrigued by their collaboration. Mm-hmm. They want to see what they've come up with this time. Right, and there's o- there's only a, there's only a couple of other collaborations like it in cinema. You know, you have uh, if you talk about the present day, you have, uh, Tim Burton and Danny Elfman, which has lasted for God knows how long. And there's only been one. There's only been one where Elfman didn't do the score, but then they got a, right. I think. Uh, James Houston Howard and M. Night Shire Mullen. I'm not even sure. I that's know, that's one of them. Yep. He, that's they, one of them. That's lasted for 20 something years, 27 years, I think. Right. The Coen brothers and Carter Burwell, they've Correct. lasted for 30, they've lasted for 35 years. Lasted, really? Wow. 35. Every, everything, every Coen brothers film that's had a score from Blood Simple up through the most recent, The Ballad of Buster Scruggs, um, there's only, there's every time they've had a film score. It's been Carter Burwell, and then um, there's been a couple of Coen Brothers movies where there's been no score. I reckon James Cameron and James Horner would have lasted a hell of a long time. They would have, and they would have. Not they had that untimely passing. Right. James um, Horner, of course. Mm-hmm. 
Alan Silvestri also with Robert Zemeckis. Al oh yeah, oh that's another one right yes. there that's lasted that's lasted thirty five years. Many. Romancing romance romancing the stone up through the most recent Welcome to Marwen, I think. Yes. Um, which I haven't seen. Nor have I. I, I haven't seen, but it's on the yeah it's on the never ending Z list. Oh. Um, I mean, there's, there's there's so many that we can talk about, and we've talked about some of them. We've talked about Hitchcock and Herman, yes. talked about um, Miyazaki and Hasashi. We've talked mm -hmm. about uh, and Leone. yeah, exactly. But this one, even though I'm even though Hitch, I've often referred to Hitchcock and Herman as my favorite, there is not one that has probably inspired more directors and composers more than Spielberg and Williams. This is often pointed to, and this is often referred to as the prime example of a director-composer collaboration because it has lasted for so many movies and for so many years. And then um, you that, see them together, I mean, there's footage of them together, working <laughs> together, there's beautiful footage of them um, talking e. about the ET school. And yeah. you see there's such a sweet bond between them, you know, they're like, they're like film brothers. <laughs> they are film brothers. and it's so or, sweet. And in some cases, in some cases, Williams was kind of teaching. Is Williams has also been kind of a mentor to Spielberg because he's been in the film industry longer than Spielberg has, too. You know, he's been in the film industry for seven decades now, and you know, Spielberg started in the '70s or late '60s, and so he kind of grew up. And Williams, as he was growing up, Williams was teaching him. About you know, because I know that the first film that Spielberg asked Williams to score for him was, what was it, The Sugarland Express, wasn't it? But yeah. he came in as like a complete newbie, uh, Spielberg. I think they had a sort of a blind date kind of lunch sort of uh, meeting. Right. And, but, but why, I wonder what it was that Spielberg said, I want John Williams. He was so new. What, what, what had he seen or heard? And he's like, okay, John Williams is the one I want. Well, Williams had been getting uh, notice throughout the 60s uh, as somebody who could do piano, jazz, and symphonic uh, scores like nobody's business. And he had a number of TV credits to his name. He had, um, he was uh, working consistently uh, with directors like Mark Rydell, um, and uh, Robert Altman, and doing, and he also did a lot of disaster pictures too. Uh, the Poseidon Adventure mm -hmm. was one that was nominated for the Oscar, and he wrote this, you know, this big epic score. But um, I, I don't know for sure what was the thing that got that got Spielberg's interest. But um, the fact is, does it matter? Because no, of course not. Because look what we have now to show for it. Look what we have exactly. Um, yeah. But, no, I'm just curious. It's, a, it's just a point of interest. Do you have any final thoughts on the score for ET? The score is miraculous. And, and also, what theme do you think we should play to to, to well, if, our podcast episode? If we if we haven't played the flying theme yet, let's do that. Or we could do or or we could or we could or we could do over the moon, which is the end credits theme. Um, ba -da 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 -da, the one that you said sounded like Psycho. <laughs> so, whichever one you want. Okay, sure. Okay, I'll play one of those, and then maybe when we end <laughs> the podcast, we'll play the other. Let's, uh, so let's give a quick shout out to our other uh, yeah, scores let me on the pull poll. That up. Uh, where are yes. we? Facebook, which is currently muted because I've had a bad experience with Messenger um, mm -hmm. ruining <clears throat> our podcast. But Global Composers Network, here we go. Our poll. So we had, uh, we had Yentl. 
we had um, yet. by Michel Legrand, um, mm -hmm. which I was curious about because I've never actually seen the film. Um, and um, I happen to know a song or two from mm -hmm. the score because of the TV show Glee. Right. Um, beautiful songs, no doubt. Um, Fun mm -hmm. Surprise is always a treasure. So it would be nice to see that at some point. Mm -hmm. um, possibly maybe we could do a musical poll one time. We can take West Side Story, we could take Limbs of Up, or we can do a few, uh, yeah. a few of those. That would be interesting. Yeah, um, we haven't you, covered it. You picked yet. Crouching mm -hmm. Tiger, so go ahead. Crouching Tiger, yeah, this one, um, <clears throat> if you haven't seen Crouching Tiger at this point, put this at the put this near the top of your list. This is one of the best martial arts movies I've ever seen, and it's by one of the world's greatest directors, Ang Lee. Mm -hmm. um, score by Tan Dun, and I think Yo-Yo Ma contributed some oh, fabulous yeah. cello work. Yeah, yeah, um, and it was it, it beat out um, it beat out both Williams for The Patriot, and it beat out Hans for Gladiator that year. So if you're wondering why Hans didn't get the Oscar for Gladiator, <laughs> Crouching Tiger. Crouching Tiger, y'all. Yeah, and then we had, I picked, I think, The Social Network as another Oscar winner. I'm always right. intrigued by a score done by Trent Reznor and Atticus Ross, and I'll tell you why, and you're gonna laugh because, well, you don't know this, but I say this every time Trent Reznor's name comes up. But mm -hmm. um, when I just when I just started with film scoring, well, film scoring, but with music composition, um, uh, do you know there's like a, you know the uh, DVD score documentary? They came out with mm -hmm. they came out with a quiz. You take this quiz, and it's going to tell you which composer you're the most similar to. And everybody was getting uh, Thomas Newman, Hans Zimmer, and all the very regular ones that are spoken about all the time. And I happened to get Trent Reznor, uh -huh. <laughs> which is a really odd choice because he's so erratic. Like he's quite an erratic. He's got a lot of rock history, and he's a are rebellious. You a nine are you? Are you a Nine Inch Nails fan? Uh, not, I've never really heard their work. I should have a listen because you know I've heard yeah. stuff about it. But he's like a he's got a rebellious streak. So he's I definitely think, he's definitely yeah yeah I thought he, how does, he does he does he does his his film work is mostly very 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 synthetic. It's kind of, it's the kind of it's the kind of score that works brilliantly in the movie, but you wouldn't really listen to it on its own as music. Mm. So. Yeah, no, you wouldn't. It's true. I mean, I I flicked on the Gone Girl score the other day, and I thought I don't know how long I can listen to this by itself. <laughs> yeah, and then we uh, had uh, I think you picked the next one. Right, Babel by Gustav uh, Santo Santo Laya Laya. Mm -hmm. um, Jesus, I can't pronounce. Um, <laughs> which good. I haven't I haven't seen, but uh, he won the previous year for Brokeback Mountain. So. Um, you don't like that, do but, you? <laughs> what, what do you mean? You don't like the fact that they um, that they win one, that, that, like that one won, year that after won, the other. Well, you know, I mean, <laughs> but and then you know, we I had uh, then we had Slumdog Millionaire by A. R. Rahman, um, mm -hmm. and I mean, I've been a fan of Rahman for a while. I always get like a. Uh, 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 you know, we have a lot of um, Rah uh, some Rahman fans are from that part of the world from from the East, um, who you know, feel gush about Rahman from here to Kingdom Come, and when, Kingdom Come excuse me, and when I tell them, you know, I'm a Rahman fan, they get really, really surprised. They get, oh, you're a Rahman fan, that's great. I've got all his music. He's, he's really good. He's, yeah. done a, he's done a few other um, uh, Hollywood feature films. Um, he did um, he did The 500 Foot Journey, which I really, really liked, um, starring Helen Mirren. Um, and uh, yeah, he's a fantastic songwriter as well and music producer. I he came. To... He he came to do uh, a clinic with Berkeley, um, actually a couple of uh, a couple of years ago um, when I was when I was still there and I got to hear him talk and it was pretty amazing. Yeah, that, that. So, he's, he's an yeah. interesting fellow. Um, mm -hmm. That's wicked. Well, hopefully we'll, we we will revisit some of those at a later date. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, and that I guess wraps it up for this week. Um, wraps up for this week. When, go go and go enjoy the Oscars. Yeah, and uh, well, is this this is the last episode before the Oscars, this, right? That's correct. Right. Okay. So, the, the Oscars are next week. They're on the twenty fourth. That's right. Okay. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Mm -hmm. We've got the John Powell interview happening on Tuesday. 
Oh, yay. I know, it's all very exciting. Exciting things happening at the Global Composers Network. And we always look forward to presenting you with our next poll soon. Deb and I will put our heads together at some point. Yes, and, uh, go, go fly over the moon, you lovely composers, you. Yes, you do that. Um, but not all so right. high, just be careful. <laughs> right. <laughs> and um, I guess, arrivederci. All right. I'll see you guys. Yeah. See you guys soon. Thanks, Mary. See you soon. Bye. Bye. -bye.